Hello, this is Mr. Millings, and today I just want to explain the concept of latent heat effusion and latent heat of vaporization. All right, and then I want to apply those concepts to several different examples later on in this video. All right, so let's take a look at an example. Let's suppose I have an ice cube, and I throw this ice cube out in the middle of a street on a hot summer day. Well, what's going to happen to this ice cube? It's going to melt. All right. Furthermore, let's suppose I fill an ice tray up with water and I throw it in the freezer. What's going to end up happening to that ice over time? Well, it's going to freeze. Okay, latent heat effusion, people, is the amount of energy it takes to turn a solid into a liquid or a liquid back into a solid. All right. So when we're discussing heat effusion, we're looking at the amounts of energy that are absorbed or released by substances as they change, change states and matter from solid to liquid or liquid to solid. All right, let's take a look at heat of vaporization. All right, let's suppose I have a, uh, a, a pot of water and I throw it on the stove and I turn it on full blast. Well, what's going to happen to this water over time is that it's going to absorb thermal energy from the stove, from the flame of the stove, and what's going to happen to it? Well, over time, it's going to boil. All right? At 100 degrees Celsius, this water is going to start boiling. Okay? Furthermore, let's suppose you get out, uh, you get out of a shower on a, uh, on a cold winter morning, right? And you go to comb your hair, and there's all this water on your mirror. Well, what has happened there is that those water molecules that were in the gaseous stage hit that cold mirror, and those water molecules condensed and turn back into uh, a liquid. All right, so in these examples over here, we've got a liquid turning into a gas and a gas turning into a liquid, two different changes in state of matter. And when we talk about heat of vaporization, we are referring to the amount of energy that is associated with a liquid turning into a gas or a gas turning into a liquid. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about latent heat of fusion and latent heat of vaporization and take a look at the energies that must be released or absorbed when these two processes, or rather when these four processes, take place. Okay, so let's take a look at the next slide. Okay, in this slide here, I uh, just want to talk a little bit about the heat of vaporization and heat of fusion of water specifically. Now, each substance has its own heat of vaporization and heat of fusion. However, right now we're just going to talk specifically about water. All right, let's take a look. We have some ice over here, and uh, this ice is going to melt and turn into water. And if I continue to heat this water up or add some sort of thermal energy to this water, it's going to turn into water vapor over time. All right, conversely, if I cool this water vapor down, it's going to condense and turn back into water. And if uh, this water loses more energy or thermal energy or releases thermal energy, it's going to turn back into ice. So what we're going to do in this little slide is talk about the heat of fusion of water and the heat of vaporization of water as they change states in matter. Okay, so let's start over here with the ice. Okay, let's suppose I have some ice and this ice here is at, uh, at its melting point or freezing point of zero degrees Celsius. Okay, and what we're going to do with this ice is we're going to throw it under some sort of heat source. Okay, whether it's a Bunsen burner or the sun or, uh, or a stove. All right, and what's going to happen to this ice if we do that is it's going to melt. It's going to melt and turn into water. Okay, but let's suppose that there is no temperature change. Let's suppose all this takes place at zero degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point or melting point of water. All right, in that case here, we will have to take a look at the heat of fusion for water. All right. In other words, if I've got one gram of this ice here and I want to melt it and turn into water, how much thermal energy must this ice absorb in order to turn it into water? Well, the answer to that question is right here. It will take 334 joules of thermal energy to turn one gram of ice into water. Now, you'll notice that the sign of this heat of vaporization here is positive. And it's positive because melting ice is an endothermic process. And anytime we have an endothermic process, the sign will be positive. Okay? Let's go the other way. What if I've got some water and I want to freeze it? 
Okay, if you have some water and you want to freeze it, then those water molecules must lose a certain amount of thermal energy in order to change state and matter and convert it into ice. Well, how much thermal energy do you think needs to be lost? Well, that's right here. If you take a look going the other way, this water will need to release 334 joules of thermal energy to convert it back into ice. And as you see right here, the sign of this is negative. Okay? Water turning into ice is an exothermic process, and therefore the sign for the heat of fusion should be negative. Let's look over here on the other side. Okay, if we take a look at the other side here, we've got water turning into water vapor. Now let's suppose that this water here is turning into water vapor right at around 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point or condensation point of water. All right, we want to know how much thermal energy must this water absorb in order to turn it into water vapor? Well, the answer to that question, people, is right here. If you take a look here, if you've got one gram of water at 100 degrees Celsius and you want to turn this into water vapor at 100 degrees Celsius, then this water right here will need to absorb 2,260 joules of energy. You'll notice once again that the sign in front of here is positive. Okay, that is because turning water into water vapor is an endothermic process. This water here must absorb thermal energy from its surroundings to change its state of matter into water vapor. All right, let's look the other way. What if we have some water vapor here, that's water in the gaseous state, and we want to condense this and turn it back into water? Well, how much thermal energy must this water lose in order to turn it, I'm sorry, must this water vapor lose in order to turn it back into water? That answer is right here. The heat of vaporization for water, right? Except you'll notice right here that the sign is negative, okay? In order for these uh, water vapor molecules to slow down and turn back into water, they must release a certain amount of energy, okay? And whenever we release energy, the sign will always be negative, okay? Now, different substances have different heats of fusions and different heats of vaporizations. So this is here, these numbers right here, the 334 and the 2260 joules per gram are only specific to water. So let's take a look at some uh, heats of fusions and heats of vaporizations for other substances. Okay, if we take a look at this table, all this table is showing us is uh, the heat of vaporization and the heat of fusion for various substances. We have water, we have lead, we have aluminum, and we have gold. And like we just said in the, uh, the slide before this, that the, uh, the heat of fusion for water is 334 joules per gram. So if I have one gram of water and I want to melt one gram of water, it will take 334 joules of thermal energy to do so. Or if I have one gram of uh, water here and I want to uh, turn it into water vapor, that water will need to absorb 2,260 joules of energy in order to do so. All right, so in this table here, I just wanted to show you that different substances have different heats of fusions and different heats of vaporizations. Uh, if you take a look, lead, the heat of fusion is 24.5 joules per gram. It's eight, uh, the heat of vaporization is 870 joules per gram, etc., etc. So if we take a look at this question down at the bottom, it says, how many times more energy does it take to boil water compared to melting ice, assuming they have the same masses and are under the same amounts of pressure. Well, if you take a look here, the heat of fusion for water, that is the amount of energy it takes to melt uh, ice and turn it into water, is 334 joules. The heat of vaporization, that is the amount of energy it takes to turn water into water vapor, is 2,260 joules. So as you see right here, if you compare these two, you can see that it takes about seven times more energy to turn water into water vapor than it does to turn uh, ice into water. Okay, so the answer to this question right here will be about seven times more energy to turn water into water vapor compared to ice into water. Okay, now that we have the concept of heat of vaporization and heat of fusion down, 
Uh, we're going to work some, with some examples relating to water and the heat of vaporization and heat diffusion of water. So let's look at this example here. In this example, we need to calculate the amount of energy associated with changing 100 grams of water to water vapor at 100 degrees Celsius. Now this is important right here, 100 degrees Celsius. If we take a look at this, there is no change in temperature. All right, there is no change in temperature. All the energy in this problem is going to changing the state of matter. If we have a change in temperature, then that's a totally different problem that uh, I will show you in a, in a subsequent video. So let's take a look at this though. Okay, we want to calculate the amount of energy associated with changing 100 grams of water to water vapor. All right, so if we want to turn water into water vapor, this is going to be a heat of vaporization problem, and we must use one of these two heats of vaporizations. So let's take a look here. We've got 100 grams of water, and we want to know we want to know how much thermal energy this 100 grams of water will need to absorb to turn it into water vapor. All right, so we want to turn this water into water vapor. So what are we going to use? We are going to use this right here, right? We are going to use the heat of vaporization right here, right? Turning water into water vapor is, a, is an endothermic process. So we'll use this top one right here. All right, so let's go ahead and solve this problem here. All right, we know that it will take 2,260 joules of energy that this water will need to absorb per gram, okay, of water. So this will now cancel out with this unit here. And now you just get your calculator out and your final answer should be 226,000 joules of energy. And our sign on this will be positive because that water is going to need to absorb this much energy. And anytime something absorbs this much energy, our sign will be positive. Let's take a look at the next example. All right, in this example here, it says to calculate the amount of energy associated with changing 250 grams of water to ice at zero degrees Celsius. So once again, there is no temperature change in this problem. The temperature is staying the same. What's happening is that this water is going to release a certain amount of energy and once it does so uh, then if it continues to release more energy uh, all that energy I'm sorry the temperature will start start to decrease all right so here we go we've got 250 grams of water right and if we take a look at the question here this water is going to turn into ice all right, so we've got water turning into ice. This looks like a heat of fusion problem right here. And because the water is releasing energy in order to turn into ice, you'll take a look at the sign in front of uh, the number here, and it's negative, okay? So we know that one gram of water is associated with 334 joules of energy. And if we take a look, the water is turning into ice, so our sign should be negative. So we get our calculator out, and we simply take 250 times negative 334, and we'll end up with our answer of negative 83,500 joules. All right, so the question here, how much energy is associated with the... Uh, with changing 250 grams of water to ice at zero degrees Celsius? Well, it looks like this water is going to need to release 83,500 joules of thermal energy in order to do so. Let me fix that here. All right, let's take a look at another example. All right, in this problem here, we are asked to calculate the amount of energy associated with changing 10 grams of ice to water. So in this problem here, we've got 10 grams of ice right and this ice is going to melt and turn into water so this looks like a heat of fusion problem right a heat of fusion problem okay so let's go ahead and jump right in here so we've got uh, let's see 10 grams of ice which essentially is water and because this is a heat of fusion problem we know that the heat of fusion uh, of water is 334 joules for every gram, right? 
That means in order for ice to turn into water, it must absorb 334 joules for every gram of water. Right, and because we're going from ice to water, this ice is going to have to absorb thermal energy, and so our sign here should be positive. This unit right here will cancel out with this unit right here. Put this in your calculator, and you should end up with this answer right here with a positive sign. So how much thermal energy must 10 grams of ice absorb in order to change it into water? All of this, of course, is happening at zero degrees Celsius with no temperature change. 3,340 joules must be absorbed. Let's take a look at another example. All right, in this example, we have to calculate the amount of energy associated with changing 200 grams of water vapor to water. Okay, so in this problem here, we've got 200 grams of water vapor and this water vapor is going to release a certain amount of energy and it's going to convert into water and what we have to do is we have to figure out how much thermal energy this water vapor needs to release in order to turn it back into water okay so in this problem here we've got 200 grams of water vapor that's H2O that's in the gaseous state and we want to know how much thermal energy people this water vapor will need to release in order to change its state back into liquid water. Well, we know that the heat of fusion, I'm sorry, the heat of vaporization for water is 2260 joules for every gram of water. However, let's take a look at what's happening. This water vapor is releasing energy in order to convert it back into water. So our sign here is going to be negative. So now we have this set up correctly. Grams of H2O will cancel out. Grams of H2O will cancel out. I get my calculator out here and I take 200 times a negative 2260 and you will end up with a negative 452,000. Okay? So this 200 grams of water vapor will need to release 452,000 joules of thermal energy in order to change it all back into water. So I hope you guys understand the concept of heat of vaporization and heat of fusion. And I hope you guys uh, are able to uh, use the examples that I provided in this video to solve some of your own chemistry problems dealing with thermochemistry. I hope this was helpful.